With a newly elected Republican leader manning the ship, members of the Kentucky legislature survived a sometime contentious, often frictious session and emerged with a compromise two-year state budget aimed at keeping the Commonwealth afloat financially. Up next on Outlook, we're going to talk with House Speaker Pro Tem Jody Richards and Senator Whitney Westerfield for a recap of the 2016 session. Stay with us. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us. Well, analysts, politicians, citizens, leaders, they're wasting little time analyzing the results of the just completed session of the Kentucky General Assembly. The 2016 session was a harsh wake up call on the issue of $36 billion in unfunded pension liability threatening the financial stability of the Commonwealth. Well, with a newly elected Republican governor at the helm, the battle cry was budget cuts. And after much discussion, analysis, and debate, the Kentucky General Assembly passed a two-year state budget. Means cuts. How harsh? Well, let's take a look at that as we welcome to the program two individuals in the know. Speaker Pro Tem, Democratic Representative from the 20th District, Jody Richards, joins us. And representing the District 3, the 3rd District, which includes Christian, Todd, and Logan, Senator Whitney Westerfield, who's a newbie to the program. Welcome. I am. Thanks We're for having me. Glad to have you here. So before we get started, there's lots to talk about. We heard so much about when a new leader's there, there's, there's always this little bit of kind of getting to know you, if you will, learning the dynamics. Was it as you expected? You've been through a few of these. Well, it's, a, it's really difficult for a new governor because uh, he or she is elected uh, the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, takes pl uh, office five weeks later, about five more weeks, and 138 uh, General Assembly members come to town and then about 15 days after that he has to present a balanced budget and in the meantime he's had to appoint uh, staff and, and get ready for the uh, budget and, and, and uh, the session and get up to speed on all of it and uh, I thought all in all he uh, there's no question he's a quick study and uh, had certainly had his views on how things should be done and all 138 of us have our views on how sure. things should be done. So, uh, but in the end, uh, as they say, all is well, it ends well. It came out uh, pretty well. I would change some things, uh, and so would Senator Westerfield, but it is a good pattern for the next two years. We're gonna talk more about that, but just to answer that first, first question, if you will, you uh, got to where you are in 2012, and so you know, you're relatively new at this by comparison. Were you anticipating this type of get-go? Uh, I, I was, but I haven't seen a change of, of administration right. like that up close before. Uh, so it was, it was interesting political theater for me to watch that for the first time, but I would agree uh, with the speaker. I think the, the governor is a pretty quick study, certainly has his perspectives and views on, on what government should do and what it shouldn't do and where we should spend money and where we shouldn't. And I agree that conflicts not just with one chamber or the other, but all 138 members of the legislature have a different opinion just about anything you can put in front of us. Uh, but I think he did well. Uh, and I think we do have a budget. And again, the speaker's right. Both of us would find things that we did, didn't approve of or agree with entirely. But overall, we come out with, with a balanced budget that's going to set us on a good course for the next couple of years. I mean, the big issue was this unfunded pension, you know. So $36 billion, that's a lot of money. Did we have to have somebody come in there and say, shake it up and say, got to do something now? Well, we actually did some things in 2012 which really set us on a good path in terms of the KERS, the employees. Uh, the, we passed some, and it, it was difficult, but... Uh, people, uh, state employees are going to have to work longer uh, and uh, there will be uh, other uh, and the contributions will be more for they will con contribute more and so will the cities and counties and, and their state and their employers. So it's a uh, we made a, a change there which in the long run will be very helpful. You're saying in 2012 some of this legwork oh, was oh done. Oh yes, all that was done in 2012 and then okay. in 2016 uh, 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 we tried to do something about the teachers retirement but 
uh, we, the House and Senate couldn't agree on how to do it. So uh, now the one thing we don't know for sure, and there will be a uh, there will be an audit of both of the pension right. uh, 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 firms, of pension uh, systems, and we will find out exactly whether that 36 million is accurate or not right. accurate. Okay, so an audit, which kind of sounds like, yeah, that's probably a really good idea to know where we're at. So it's kind of calling all things together and saying, all right, we're gonna find out exactly where things lie and we're gonna move from there. We, we've seen data that shows where some of the biggest reductions in the, in the amount, or rather the biggest growth in our unfunded liability comes from investments not doing what we thought they were gonna do over the last 10, 15 years. That's the biggest bulk of it. Uh, there have been times uh, prior to my tenure in the legislature where the General Assembly has borrowed from this fund or that. But as far Stealing as I know- Stealing from Peter to pay Paul Yes, ma'am, but, but so far as I know today, those have long since, again, even before I got there, were already paid back, and I think with interest. But those sorts of ideas sort of still ring in people's minds and in the, in the citizens that we represent. Uh, if for nothing else to, to put to rest any questions about how big this hole really is, I think the audits are, are worthwhile to know where we're spending the money, what sort of investment return we've gotten, um, there, there was a great big debate, and I'll say this about the governor, and there was actually a member of the, the Herald Leader uh, press team that uh, tweeted this out sometime a month or so ago. Uh, he said, this governor, if he's done anything, he's managed to get both sides, both the House and the Senate, uh, talking about how much to spend towards pensions. And we've put almost $1.3 billion, the most amount in history, towards all these pension funds, KTRS, the teachers fund, gets almost a billion of that $1.28 billion, nine, 973, $974 million. Um, again, this is over and above what they've asked for, but we've got to start digging out of this hole. And got to, it's like, uh, I guess with alcoholism, they say you have to admit you have a problem before <laughs> somebody will get some help. I mean, it's you right. have to admit there's a problem, but wait a Let second. What about this transparency bill? Okay, I guess Kentucky law exempts the investments of pension funds from open records law. And yet, this kind of is all in keeping with what you're saying. We have to be a little more transparent. You're grinning. And I, you would, I would defer to the speaker. because okay. Well, House it passed the Senate, and it, uh, uh, it did not pass the House. It got out of the committee, but did not pass the House. Uh, a lot of things got toward the end, did not pass, that a lot of people would have liked to, had passed. But mm -hmm. uh, the budget took so long. Uh, and uh, it, it just uh, to As try to make it work, yes. As it should. And, 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 and so a lot of things passed or, or did not pass that we would have both liked to have had. Well, if you're saying that this audit is going to happen, that might answer some of the questions. Well, about, I hope so. Uh, yeah. I hope so to, to really tell, to show where the money's coming and going. I, I do hope that in 2017 that this transparency <laughs> effort can succeed. Uh, I, I think there's no reason it's public money that there's no part of it that should be concealed from the people from who's, the who are paying for it. And by the way, I agree with that completely. Yeah, and, and there are a number of yeah, Democrats who do. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit more about that. We're going to take a short break. And, you know, the governor, Governor Bevin, was shouting 9% cuts. Had a lot of people in fear, a lot of people running. Turned out to be 4.5 recurring. We're going to talk a little bit more about that when Outlook continues with Speaker Pro Tem Jody Richards and Senator Whitney, Whitney Westerfield. Stay with us. Outlook continues here on WKUPBS. I'm Barbara Deeb. Well, the 2016 session of the Kentucky General Assembly is now history. But what will its ramifications be and mean? We're going to find out more about that as we welcome back for this second segment Speaker Pro Tem Jody Richards. In addition, we are joined by Senator Whitney Westerfield. We were talking about how your name, sometimes it's a, <laughs> it's a little tongue twister, but we're happy to have you here, Whitney Westerfield. So before the break, we were talking about the budget and the need to cut the budget. So Governor Bevin, our new Republican governor, comes in and he says, people, you need to wake up. We have this pension shortfall. It's time. You know, we've got to do something about it. So we talk about frictious, we like that word, you know, that means friction and contentious as far as the budget negotiations went. But in your experience, was that indeed the case? A lot of pushing and pulling and wrangling? About, maybe a little worse than normal, but pretty much normal. I mean, people have different views on what should be done. And when you get both sides uh, together, uh, uh, they have have different views and and the parties have different views but at the same time uh, uh, 
yeah, there's there's always uh, a little peacefulness in, in the beginning, then there's a big blow up, and then, then we get serious. So it, it followed the pattern. Yes. Before the break, we also were talking about Governor Bevin coming in and projecting, you know, we here in higher education, the public television station is affiliated with the university, sure. you know, looming above each day was, you know, what are we going to find out today? You know, what cuts are looming? What is that going to mean for what we do? 9% was bandied about. In your opinion, was that a strategic move, that 9%? Or was it, we'll throw 9% out there, but then we'll come back in, maybe have that, and then save the day? Oh, I I, I have no first-hand knowledge of it, but I, I'm assuming it's the latter. I, I assume that, that it was intentionally put out there as a, as a horrible worst-case scenario worst case sort scenario. of cut mm -hmm. uh, and that there would be a, a desire to compromise somewhere in the middle. Maybe not. That, that could be – he may still want it, 9%, mm -hmm. uh, and be disappointed by the 4.5. And, um, and I haven't been at this nearly as long as others have been. This is only the second budget I've had an opportunity to have – have a hand in writing, so, um, and and I've had one Democratic governor, and one Republican governor, so I don't have a whole lot of comparison uh, to make. And I think both sides, both chambers, the leadership in the House, the leadership in the Senate, are still learning this governor, and this governor is still learning the leadership in both chambers. Um, he's he is, and I don't think the speaker would disagree. He's a different kind of guy, different mm -hmm. kind of uh, mm -hmm. politician. If mm -hmm. that's more what like you want a businessman, would you? Call it's him? different from that. Yeah, I'd say. it is. I, it's truly someone who, who hasn't been around the, the Frankfurt apparatus in either party's shoes before. It's, it's a little refreshing. For some people, it, not me, but for others, I can sense it's a little frustrating, frustrating. Uh, or even disconcerting uh, to some. But I like the idea. It, it, it doesn't seem to me like he cares what happens. He doesn't have to have the job. Mission, it's, it's all about the mission, solve yeah. the mission, who cares uh, what happens put, along put the way. Put philosophical differences aside, whether you agree with him or not, he's going forward in a direction that he thinks is best, and hes I don't think he has regard for whether or not he can get a second term. I'm sure he wants one, but ultimately that's not the objective or some run for something else after this. Um, and that can't always be said for, for people who are so in the So that could be seat. refreshing. Let's get into the meat and bones of 4.5%, okay? So finally, on the last day of the session, a budget <coughs> was reached. And with that 9% looming, um, here we find out 4.5% recurring. Help us understand what that well, looks and, like. Well, and 4.5% four, four and, and, and next year and the next. This year, since there is a... Uh, question, uh, legal question, of whether the governor can cut in the current budget, uh, that uh, is just off the table. Uh, we didn't... Uh, Excuse me, if we could, for our audience, there was talk that those cuts were going to happen immediately, right. which had a lot of people in a panic. In, in but fact, the governor did take back four and a half percent from uh, the universities and, and from a lot of different agencies, and the attorney general stepped in and said, you don't have the right to do that. Uh, uh, in, in, in my opinion, he does not have the right to do that. Now, Senator Westerfield may see that differently. Uh, we, it has been adjudicated that he cannot add. See, the, the, the General Assembly sets the policy. We write the budget. The governor carries it out. That's his responsibility. Uh, he cannot add to it. He can't give right. Western more money. Uh, I don't think he can take it away either. Now, uh, we'll see that. Uh, to me, taken to that uh, uh, greatest extent, if he could do that, he could take money away from the sure, General from Assembly anybody, if, he didn't, right. if he didn't like us. It, it's, it's actually, I mean, it's much more nuanced than that. I agree with the Speaker entirely. I think if he was going to cut an appropriation, uh, that he'd have to go through what uh, even the attorney general mentioned yeah, in his complaint right you've got to go through the budget reduction steps yeah. there are things you've got to cut before you can cut this um, the governor's argument and this is going to be fought out in the courts but the governor's argument is that he's not changing the appropriation which would require going through these steps which he's in fact already done related to a road plan issue earlier in the year he's changing an allotment and statute recognizes an allotment the universities get an allotment each quarter and he's making an adjustment on the last quarter's allotment. So the 4.5% in the current budget year uh, that people are talking about him having done is actually only 4.5% of the last quarter's allotment to the universities. And it's entirely possible he may still fulfill that full allotment. Now, if he doesn't, 
that would make for some interesting legal argument. But there's a distinction between changing that allotment, or the timing of the allotment even, and making an actual cut. Uh, that's what the legal argument is for the current budget year. But as we look to these others, I think it's important for, for the next biennium, for, these, for 17 and 18, uh, the public universities, uh, their employees, they benefit from... Uh, uh, KTR. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and so we've, we have to be able to pay on this debt. So you're saying strike some kind of balance here that, you know, people, you might have to suffer these cuts, but look sure. at in the end, you're going to get your retirement. And, you're gonna and get I your don't pension. know anybody up there that looked forward to cutting them. Uh, maybe one or two. <laughs> but but, but let's, let's talk a little bit more about, uh, so 4.5, all right, 4.5%. Uh, first 17 and 18. Yeah, 17 right. and 18. And then what? Well, then uh, you have a new budget. Yeah, we write another budget. Yeah, you, uh, and then we can come only, back around. We can only bind the state for two years. Right. right. But that having been said, you know, you walked away from this, you see what's happening, you'll assess it at that point in time? Well, there are a lot of variables. The audits, for instance, uh, whether or not the returns on the investments over the next two years benefit. I, make no mistake, I don't think anybody uh, believes that this is going to be a hole that we get out of in two years' time. It's going to take a long time. So he may come and, and ask for us to sustain those cuts uh, or to or not increase spending greater. or perhaps make cuts greater. But that's yeah. his prerogative to, to ask for. But there are a lot of variables between now and 2018 when we go through this process again now, to see what it looks like. One thing that's really important in all this is that we had $900 million more to put in the budget than we did two years ago. So it was my contention, and I still feel that way, that that the 4.5% uh, cut to universities was not necessary. Now, we did put... Uh, about 175 million, if I remember correctly, in the rainy day fund, the budget reserve trust fund, and then about 130, 125 yeah. million in this permanent pension fund, and we named it that in in the conference committee, and we put parameters right. and guidelines on it so that it can only be spent uh, for. Uh, Pensions. We didn't want it to be a slush fund that, that, that anybody that could use on his own. When you needed sure. to. Also, we want to talk about performance-based funding and some of these other, the Work Ready Kentucky program. We're going to have to take another short break here on Outlook. But when we come back, more with Whitney Westerfield and Speaker Pro Tem Jody Richards. Stay with us. And we're continuing here on Outlook on WKU-PBS. We're glad that you joined us. Speaker Pro Tem Jody Richards joins us along with Senator Whitney Westerfield, who represents western parts of our area uh, in addition to the Hopkinsville area. We have Logan County, we have Christian County, and Todd, Todd counties. Thank you for that. Before the break, we were talking about uh, Governor Bevin's attempt to uh, make some cuts in the current budget, and you, you did a very nice explanation of helping us understand that those were directed at things called allotments, which come in quarters. You asked a question during the break, which I think warrants uh, sharing with our audience. You know, does he have to fulfill those yeah, original and, allotments? And, uh, you know, reasonable minds can can disagree on this. I, I just think the issue is bigger than that. I, I just don't think the governor has a right uh, under our Constitution. We have the strongest or one of the strongest separation of powers among the the three branches of any state in the country. And, and the General Assembly has been on the losing end of that a few times when we have tried to overstep our mark. Uh, but uh, to me, uh, I just, I think the big issue, if, if the only time that, that I think a governor has, a, has an opportunity to uh, decrease the appropriation is at the end of the year, and there are four statutes that deal with that, and the consensus forecasting group has to say that we, uh, there's a shortfall, and then uh, you, uh, you can cut up to 5%. Now that's, that's kind of what I had always thought about. Okay, so that helps us understand that. We talked about performance-based funding, which is going to be directed at graduation rates and retention in the universities in the state of Kentucky, and something called the Work Ready Kentucky Program. Now, it's no secret that, you know, we need jobs, okay? We have a lot of corporations and manufacturers out there who say <coughs> we have jobs, we just don't have the skilled workers to fill these jobs. 
So is this an answer, this Work Ready Kentucky program, is this kind of an answer to that question? It, it is, and, it, and, and, and I'll let Senator Westerfield talk about the $100 million bond also, but the Work Ready Kentucky, Tennessee has done something like this called, called Tennessee, Tennessee Promise. Promise. And uh, we brought uh, uh, Jay Box, the president of the community and technical colleges in and, and came up with this plan. The, uh, then it was uh, refined a bit more in the conference committee to uh, put a, uh, a, a, an amount of money that can be spent in each year so it, it wasn't a runaway train. But was it, so it, all in all, it's $25 million to fund tuition scholarships right. for high schoolers who are seeking an associate's degree. That's, that that's right, and it can be in community and technical colleges or, or in the, state or private or universities. universities. So long no. as they offer one of the qualifying right. asso yeah, associate's so, degrees. So, okay, there are qualifying associate's degrees. Yeah, so yes. uh, the, the main point, though, is that it's not limited just to KCTCS. Right. Uh, WKU technical can take colleges. advantage of it. And it, it is an attempt. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have around the state, and particularly in this area, we do not have the trained workers uh, to uh, meet the kinds of jobs that have been created uh, since the 08 uh, recession. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we came back, th those, a lot of those jobs are not there and a lot of more high-tech jobs are available. As a former Commonwealth's attorney, you, the, the penal code and, the, and that system, the juvenile system, is very Im important part of your life. Expungement was something that we heard a lot. That's another fun word during this past <laughs> session. And what we were talking about is, and, and apparently this is something that touched you very personally. You, you had a client or a victim that you ran into. Share that story. <clears throat> well, I'll say that the expungement bill, as Senate Judiciary Chairman, I've had an opportunity to pass Representative Darrell Owens' bill for the last three years. Uh, it may have been Jesse Crenshaw's before it was Daryl's. Uh, but for the last three years, I haven't moved it. It's been in my hands, and I could have given it a hearing uh, any time, but I didn't. I had philosophical objections to it and some logistical things. Excuse me, explain for our viewers what we're talking about when we say expensive. This is, this is House Bill 40, and it's, that, it's been given that number every year. And this bill would allow for low-level Class D, that's a bottom-level felony offenders, uh, to have their records expunged. The idea being that you've got a lot of folks who have done... Uh, some dumb criminal thing when they were yeah 18 very young, 20 yes. um, and then they've they've done that they've served their sentence they're off paper as we say in the prosecuting world uh, and then they've gone for several years and not done anything else wrong but then they go to apply for a job or apply for a student loan or for a scholarship and that label is still that's right still mm -hmm. on their there's record. a box they've got to check or if they if they answer it no or if they answer it yes it even if they're honest and they, they explain what went on, they've paid their, their dues to society, there are not a whole lot of employers that give them a shot. Uh, white Hydraulic and White Staffing in Hopkinsville, that's one that I'm, I'm very proud of that's local to me, but has actually gotten national recognition for doing that, for hiring convicted felons, but they're in the minority. There aren't a lot that'll do it. And again, I've been opposed to it philosophically until last October. I was still running for attorney general, uh, and I still had that on, my, on the mind for another few, another month, I guess. But we had the judiciary meeting come to Hopkinsville for its monthly meeting in October, and we heard from a gentleman who I knew was going to be on the agenda. I didn't think I'd have my mind changed. I didn't think it would uh, change my perspective at all. But he came to testify about felony expungement. And I've been approached by Chairman Owens uh, to hear the bill before. I've been approached by David Floyd, a retiring member of the House, a Republican from Bardstown, who's a primary co-sponsor as well. And I've, I've just turned him away because I've got objections to it. But this guy talked about, who testified in Hoptown, who talked about when he was 18 or 19, did something stupid with his brother, stole some radios, I've now uh, been reminded, um, ended up serving a year or two on the sentence, and then went clear for 20 plus years and didn't do anything. He did exactly what we asked the people in the criminal justice system to do. Break the law once, learn your lesson, and quit doing it. Mm -hmm. Except he hasn't been able to get work. And now he's going to school to be a physical therapist, which calls for a state us to issue a license or a certification that he's not sure and to get. He's not sure to get. He is now because, because of, of House Bill 40. Uh, but it was that day I sent a text to David Floyd and I said, man, if I'm still in this job come January, I want to move this bill. Move that bill. And it did get, we we're quickly running out of time. As we speak and on the day that we are recording this program, Governor Bevan has launched an investigation into political corruption under Steve Bashir's former Governor Steve Bashir's administration, uh, coercing uh, people to contribute into Democratic campaigns. Before we get away, you've heard that news, yes? Yes, but uh, all I know is what I 
read in the newspaper as it being said, <laughs> or watch or on hear, TV yes. or radio. And so I don't know anything about it. We'll just that just is going to have to play out. Uh, I hope it's not political. It could be. Uh, who knows? Well, and the former personnel director Longemeyer, he yeah. has and that shocked guilty. the fire out of me because I've known him for years, and I was yes. really shocked. He pleaded that. guilty, and he'll be sentenced August 18th, I think. But as it relates to this investigation that Governor Bevan has launched against the Bashir administration, this puts you in a prickly situation in that you ran for Doesn't? state. Well, I'm asking <laughs> because you ran for Attorney General, uh, Steve Bashir's son, Andy, is sure. currently yeah. I, I'm not going to comment on the investigation. The governor can do what the governor feels like he needs to do. Um, Attorney General Bashir can do what he thinks he needs to do. Um, I'll say that on the campaign trail, you hear a lot of things. I did hear those sorts of rumors, uh, but I never saw anything like that firsthand, and I, I'm not in any position to comment on it. What they talked about yesterday wasn't stuff I heard on the campaign trail. And who knows what you hear on the campaign trail. So I, let the governor do and, and the AG do what, whatever they feel led to do, and that'll play itself out, as the speaker said. Um, and who picks up the tab for this investigation? The citizens of Kentucky? Well, there, there will be a, uh, uh, a, a group that will do that. Uh, he will let a, a personal service contract to, to do that, and I assume to... Uh, mm. I assume he's I, got X number of dollars to yeah, spend. There, yeah. It's in the budget. We're, we're just about out of time. Are you going to run for state office again? <laughs> oh, I no, I don't know about that. I, I won't say no, but I, I'm not even more close to thinking about that. I just got off the trail not a full six months ago. Uh, I've got a 20 month old little girl that I love spending time with. And I'm just no joke speaker. My first calendar week at home since December. I'm enjoying the work of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, and as we've talked about, there's still a lot of work to do for the next four years, and God willing, I'm unopposed in this year's election, so, so I, I pray I'll be there in January to, to keep doing that good work. To be determined. Are you going to run for state office again? No, no, <laughs> I, I've done that twice, and I'm not going to do Been that there, anymore. Done that. Yes. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing the information as it relates to the just-completed 2016 session of the Kentucky General Assembly. We've been speaking with Speaker Pro Tem Jody Richards and a newbie to the Outlook program. We, we enjoyed having you here, Senator Whitney Westerfield. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition. I'm Barbara Deeb. Thanks for joining us.